This week on Worldview, is the Taliban running out of time to keep its promises on inclusive government in Afghanistan and women's rights? Is the world going to continue to engage the Taliban regime without any conditions? And just where does India stand with the Taliban and the non-Taliban leadership today? We're going to hear from the chief of the Afghan National Resistance Force, Ahmad Shah Massoud's son, Ahmad Masood in just a bit. Hello and welcome to Worldview at the Hindu with me, Sohasini Heather. This is episode 91, as in you can probably tell. Worldview is on the road this week, but we've been covering some very important uh, conferences on Afghanistan that I'm going to tell you about. So this was certainly a week where Afghanistan, which seems to be a conflict that has been practically forgotten given the war in Europe, it was back in the news again. Uh, to begin with, the Taliban regime clamped down further on women, issuing new decrees, banning them from parks, from gyms, and from any public recreation, really. Now, this is in addition to decrees already put out, banning women from most work uh, outside the home, mandating hijabs and burqas, and regulating their travel and who they can travel with. Uh, but more worryingly, there's images coming out of Afghanistan as the Taliban conducted the first public execution in years and also uh, seemed to, with the Supreme Court, revive an earlier brutal practice of public flogging. Many of these were floggings of women seen unaccompanied at some point by male relatives, which was judged their crime. And at the same time, despite banning girls from the 6th to the 12th grades, the senior secondary really, um, from attending school, the Taliban suddenly called for them to sit for examinations if they wish to, further really adding to the terrible confusion that girls in Afghanistan already face. And we'll hear more about that. Meanwhile, as the country braces for its second winter under this Taliban regime, malnourishment has increased. In fact, 90% amongst children in a year. That's the increase. Stories growing of uh, parents selling their kidneys, even drugging their children in order to stave off the hunger and get them to sleep. Now, at this time, there have been a number of conferences, as I said, also visits in the past few days that indicate that after more than a year of really giving the Taliban a free hand, uh, the world, the international community seems to be re-engaging with the Afghan issue much more seriously. So what were those? In Tajikistan's capital, Dushanbe, a conference of non-Taliban Afghan leaders where more than 100 former ministers, officials from the elected Karzai and Ghani governments, as opposed to the Taliban government that really took Kabul by force last year, men and women, members of parliament from the past, all came together for the first time since the fall of Kabul to the Taliban on August 15, 2021. The conference, which was attended by American, United States and European Union top representatives, their special envoys and ambassadors, called for an inclusive government to be formed, uh, which is something the Taliban had promised earlier, and for the non-Taliban opposition to be given a space internationally in order to regroup. They said just as the world gave the Taliban space in Qatar, the non-Taliban Afghan leadership must also be given similar space. Now, arriving at the conference, to some applause, you can see it there, the leader of the National Resistance Forces, Ahmad Massoud. He's the son of the former Northern Alliance commander, known as the Lion of Panjshir, someone India knew very well, Ahmad Shah Massoud, who was killed by Al-Qaeda operatives just days before 9-11 uh, happened as part of a kind of deal with the Taliban. Now, Massoud, the son, told the Hindu in an interview that the NRF is needed just to keep the pressure on the Taliban and claim that the NRF has actually spread beyond its base, uh, beyond the Panjshir Valley, but did not want to actually claim territory as holding on to it was difficult. In fact, we'll have excerpts from the interview later in this episode. Now, at the same time, during the week, after months of being under a virtual house arrest, former president uh, of Afghanistan, Hamid Karzai, was actually allowed to leave Kabul. He flew to the UAE and Germany, primarily for health checks, but is believed to be holding meetings with government officials in those countries. That could not have been possible without some diplomatic le legwork behind the scenes as well. And then the US Special Envoy on Afghanistan, Tom West, 
visited Japan, India and UAE for talks, while the UK's the British Prime Minister's Special Envoy on Afghanistan and Pakistan, Nigel Casey, was in Delhi and other capitals for meetings as well. So a lot of briefings going on, as well as these conferences and the travel we told you about. In Delhi, National Security Advisor Ajit Doval invited his counterparts from five Central Asian countries for the first such dialogue and Afghanistan was one of the main subjects. The participants discuss, discussed the need to curb terrorism and terror financing flows that were going into Afghanistan, drugs out of Afghanistan, and also about using new connectivity routes like Chabahar uh, in Iran that India has used in the past for aid to Afghanistan. And then in Indonesia, which is where I am, a donor pledging conference for Afghanistan women's education. So very specifically, uh, a conference on women's education and on funding it. The conference was attended by 43 countries, including seven ministers came from uh, Turkey, Pakistan and other countries. India attended, uh, but sent its ambassador to the conference. Most of those pledges really were for scholarships. But it was also a chance to hear from women both inside and outside Afghanistan, uh, and even Pakistani Nobel Peace Laureate Malala Yousafzai had a message for the conference that was hosted by the Indonesian Foreign Minister Retno Marsudi. In just one year, the world changed for women in Afghanistan. Women lost their jobs, they lost their freedom of movement, the right to participate in public spaces. Today, Afghanistan is the only country in the world that bans teenage girls from secondary school. What we are witnessing in Afghanistan is gender apartheid, and it aims to eliminate Afghan women and girls from all public life. I know how this feels because I remember how my friends and I felt when school was banned in my hometown Swat Valley. Like Afghan girls, we desperately wanted the world to know about what was happening to us. We wanted powerful voices to stand with us. That is my hope for these important discussions today that you would be courageous in standing up for the right of Afghan women and girls, that you would challenge the Taliban's misuse of Islam to prop up their regressive policies and to hold them to account. Do not let this conference be another chance to talk and not act. Now is the time for governments in the region to step up, for Muslim leaders to exercise their power to support and show solidarity for all Afghan people, especially women and girls. First, listen to the demands of Afghan women and girls sitting in the room with you. They have been on the front lines, putting themselves at risk to demand their human rights. Second, refrain from quiet normalization of relations with the Taliban over trade and transport links. Muslim country leaders must be outspoken and leverage their collective power to hold them to account. Finally, do everything in your power to push for a democratic, stable, and inclusive political system in Afghanistan, one where diverse voices, including those of women in all ethnic groups, are represented in the decision-making process. Only then will Afghanistan's women and girls see a future for themselves and take their rightful place in building the future of Afghanistan. Thank you. Meanwhile, some moves, diplomatic moves, were made with the Taliban as well. First, Pakistan's Deputy Foreign Minister, Minister of State, Hina Rabani Khar, went to Kabul and met a number of ministers there. She is, in fact, uh, optically, it was very important because she was the first woman leader to actually meet the Ka Taliban in Kabul to be received by the Taliban ministries. Pakistan-Afghanistan ties ever strong, given the ISI support to the Taliban and the Taliban's capture of power there. Now, all these years, they've had such good ties, but they've seen some strains recently over Pakistan's assistance to the U.S. for the Zawahiri bombing, Al-Qaeda leader, uh, border skirmishes, also Taliban's assistance to the TTP, which is believed to have carried out an attack on the Pakistani embassy in Kabul just last week. So a lot going on in those ties. Then the Indian mission head in Kabul, remember he's uh, uh, India runs what is called a technical mission over there, not, uh, uh, not a full-fledged uh, diplomatic mission because of course India does not recognize the Taliban. Uh, but the mission head met with the urban development minister of this acting Taliban regime and discussed several infrastructure projects India is considering to start. 
there. So the real question, there is confusion over this, where does India stand today diplomatically? To begin with, as I said, India has a mission in Kabul. Indian officials regularly hold talks with the Taliban and have done so in Doha, Moscow and other places. But like all other countries, does not recognize the Taliban as a legitimate regime. Uh, India has sent aid over this last year food as well as medicines, clothes, etc. to Afghans, of course, with the Taliban in control. One doesn't know how much is uh, getting to Afghan hands, uh, but, but certainly having the mission over there is supposed to, that's supposed to be one of the missions of the Indian mission in Kabul. Uh, third, India is considering restarting restart, infrastructure projects as it did with previous governments in Afghanistan. And, and we saw those meetings in Kabul. Fourth, India wants to discuss restarting trade or at least transit trade of some sort, possibly via Chabahar to Afghanistan. However, the Modi government has not reopened the consular section in Kabul. India has only granted a handful of visas uh, to Afghans, mostly to Afghan minorities like Hindus and Sikhs, uh, and, and, and really very few to anybody else since last August, uh, including the students who have been complaining the most. India is not supporting non-Taliban leaders at present and with the exception of former Afghanistan CEO Abdullah Abdullah, none of them have been allowed or are visiting India at present. At that conference in Dushanbe that I told you about, I actually spoke to the NRF chief Ahmed Masood about his hopes from India and the contention that non-Taliban forces are divided and that's what I started by asking him about. Okay. Uh, absolutely not, because uh, the Afghanistan history it shows that capturing power is easy, but holding on to it, it is uh, certainly not. And also, uh, the Taliban's ideology is alien to Afghanistan. Yes, they're holding on to the power for now, after one year. And the reason for that, that they are doing so, is for various factors. One of it was that, unfortunately, the world, and uh, including India, they put all of their baskets on a Public at that time, they refused to actually invest in and, and, and understand and to have a plan B of supporting the Afghan people in different constituency to withstand the, uh, the, the brutality of the Taliban or their uh, coming. Uh, the thing about the Taliban uh, and right now and on sort of them dealing, which yes, the leader used to be able to travel, but not anymore. We are united. It is time for region in the world to unite when it comes to Afghanistan. Uh, apart from a historical bond between the people of Afghanistan and people of India, uh, the government of Afghanistan always, uh, the legitimate government of Afghanistan and governments of India, uh, especially between our the historical sort of the bond that we have and my father and Professor Hamdi Babbani, the last resistance that they did with India in establishing a free, just and also uh, 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 safe uh, Afghanistan for him also to participate in this manner to, to truly find a pragmatism I believe uh, is not going it will be tactically in short term maybe uh, would uh, uh, not beneficial but would like you know show some result in, in terms of engagement the Taliban being willing to do so but uh, strategically in long long term it would more you know, cons consolidate the ideology which is uh, a terrorist ideology against all of us. You're saying India's pragmatism is not going to reap long-term benefit. I, I, obviously, you're comparing the time, as you said, with your father and Professor Rabani, when India was, in fact, giving a platform to the resistance, uh, helped out with a lot of the resistance's logistics, uh, as well as had... Um, uh, you know, had given home to 12, I think 12,000 and more Afghan refugees who had come yes. at the time. Compared to that, since 2021, yeah. um, the Indian government has clearly made a policy of offering aid to Afghans, yeah. but in Afghanistan, yeah. and not of giving visas to Afghans to travel to India. And as far as we know, have very little contact with the NRF. Have you tried to speak to India to change this? Yeah. And, uh... I believe one thing is that uh, the India is uh, very much worried about the sort of uh, the visa. This is uh, as far as a sort of I can say it is not what uh, what I've been told, but it's my own assumption is that uh, they know every when is every Thursday in Kabul for almost one year the Taliban were giving citizenship and passports to foreign terrorists. 
So it will be very hard for India to distinguish and to, uh, to know which passport holder of Afghanistan is actually a foreign terrorist coming for, uh, for creating destruction and, uh, and security threat or problem, or which one is actually genuinely uh, supportive. Of India and what's theirs for 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 safety for study uh, medical reason for whatever reason. Region, how would you like India to progress from here? Uh, it is the decision of India, but uh, given the historical context and also the strategic threats and uh, which is eminent from Afghanistan and uh, all the sorts of the uh, intel reports that we receive, uh, the uh, the sorts of uh, uh, the security it got much and all worse in the Kashmir area. It is getting worse in Pakistan and also Afghanistan. Of course, we all saw that the, the false promise of Taliban of a safety and security was completely false. And we all know that a lot of uh, international terrorist groups are finding Afghanistan as a safe haven, as a sort of training camps. So it is in, in you know, it is a necessary sort of a strategic benefit for the India and uh, and other countries to. Uh, to be preparing for Plan B as well. Let's give that the Taliban do not deliver uh, on the demand of uh, of the world. Uh, it's been one hour, one year and a half. We saw that there is not only any good changes, but actually more and more uh, extremism are showing its face in Afghanistan, stripping women from every right day by day, and then uh, all those atrocities which is happening across Afghanistan. And all of it is happening, the displacement of people and so on and so forth. So it just shows the Taliban are not changing. And this threat truly exists. And international uh, terrorists are actually coming to Afghanistan as I'm speaking to you. So all of it, it is uh, showing uh, that India, based on, because the India that I know, besides those pragmatism, India always carries a torch of value. Uh, when you stuff you know I'm seeing from the the Bollywood movies to 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 let's say the you know, the, you know, the, uh, the Indian literature to 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 to, to, to the, the speaks of Gandhi and the speaks of uh, uh, Nehru and many others it's always India was a value it was it was a, it was an ideology of democracy peace freedom justice pluralism India was a symbol of that the biggest democracy in the world so just that in a, in, a, in a country which has such a historical ties with India, and now to see that India is falling into a pragmatism, it is, it is it's stupidity. India is not like that. The India that we know and love, it is the India which goes beyond all of this. It is the India that have that torch of the value. And it is a symbol of you know, resistance for these values to too many countries, including Afghanistan. So therefore, I believe uh, beside that uh, security uh, measures uh, and the security, uh, let's say, uh, needs and interests that India truly really has and, and, and paying a close attention to the situation in Afghanistan, also those historical you know, value uh, contexts also exist for India to, to play uh, you know, a big role in uh, helping the people of Afghanistan reaching to the point to finally they also be able to live in dignified life and also to have a government that truly represents them. Ahmed Masood speaking to the Hindu there, and you can read uh, most of that interview, more of that interview in the Sunday magazine and on the Hindu's website. India's policy on Afghanistan has always been about values and principles, abandoning those today and adopting a safe strategy due to the exigencies of the Taliban short, uh, takeover is really short term and myopic in terms of foreign policy. At the least, India must consider reopening visas for Afghan students immediately, particularly for women students who have little chance of an education or to work otherwise. And India must exert more power uh, at the global stage in holding the Taliban to account. Let's get you some reading recommendations. The top of my list today are about women and women's education. The first is a book I've told you about, The Favored Daughter, One Woman's Fight to Lead Afghanistan into the Future by Fawzia Kufi, who stood for election. She was the first Afghan woman presidential candidate. She's been a member of parliament. She's been attacked by the Taliban several times, lost her husband uh, when he was imprisoned by the Taliban. 
Uh, so this is really a must read including her previous book Letters to My Daughters. Then there is a bo the book called I Am Malala, the girl who stood up for education and was shot by the Taliban, of course, talking about uh, the Pakistani Taliban there. Uh, the book is out in paperback now. It's by Malala Yousafzai and Christina Lam, journalist with the Sunday Times. Then there's The Underground Girls of Kabul in Search of a Hidden Resistance in Afghanistan by Jenny Nordberg. Very interesting from about a decade ago. Uh, Veiled Courage, Inside the Afghan Women's Resistance by Cheryl Barnard. This is about uh, the revolutionary Afghan Women's Association, Rava as it was called, that really ran the women's underground during the previous Taliban tenure. And we have to see how they group, regroup this time. Uh, Open Skies, My Life as Afghanistan's First Female Pilot by Nilufar Rehmani and Adam Sykes. So for those who say Afghanistan never really changed even with the Taliban out, this is a sign of the kind of change we saw. Uh, August in Kabul, America's Last Days in Afghanistan by Andrew Quilty is about that uh, August of 2021. Uh, this is a second edition of a book I've spoken about before, but really worth reading called Afghanistan, A Cultural and Political History, uh, coming out by Thomas Barfield. Uh, there's The American War in Afghanistan, A History, uh, which has been brought by Cartier Malkazian. Uh, of course, this has won several awards now. And a book called The Long War, The Inside Story of America and Afghanistan Since 9-11 by David Loin. In fact, uh, uh, the author himself, who's a journalist from the BBC, is expected to be in, in Delhi next uh, month, in India next month. Uh, so it might be a good time to actually read that book. Uh, finally, and this is a really interesting book written by the mother of a very famous uh, journalist, uh, Afghan Napoleon, The Life of Ahmad Shah Massoud by Sandy Gaul, uh, the mother of Carlotta Gaul. And it includes parts from Massoud's own diaries, uh, as well as her conversations with Ahmad Massoud, whom we interviewed here. Uh, so we hope you enjoy reading those and do join us again on Worldview. That's all we have time for from the team. Thanks for watching.